41 through 43. Good to see this good number out. We had such a good number for Sunday school, we had to sit on both sides of the, uh, the auditorium, which is really good. First Kings chapter 8. First Kings chapter 8, verses 41. We're also going to be in uh, Second Kings chapter 5, uh, but we're going to begin in First Kings chapter 8, verses 41. Letting our young people filter downstairs for the Bible lesson downstairs. It's just good to see each and every one of you here this morning. Glad for our visitors. All right, 1 Kings chapter 8, verse 41 through 43. Moreover, concerning a stranger that is not of thy people Israel, but cometh out of a far country for thy name's sake, for they shall hear of thy great name, and of thy strong hand, and of thy stretched out arm, when he shall come and pray toward this house, hear thou in heaven thy dwelling place, and do according to all that the stranger calleth to thee for, that all the people of the earth may know thy name to fear thee, as do thy people Israel, and that they may know that this house which I have builded is called by thy name. Let's pray this morning. Our Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you, Lord, for this time to be assembled here in this house. Father, we thank you, Lord, for those who are here to hear the word of God. Lord, we just pray, Lord, that you'll bless uh, the time that we have here, Lord, that we'll glorify the name of Jesus, Lord, that we'll lift up the name of Jesus, Lord, that those who are here, Lord, would uh, be encouraged. We pray, Lord, that you'll bless us, Lord, to have real faith, help us to have real forgiveness. Help us, Lord, to have a faith that is contagious, Lord, that those around us, Lord, would want to know more about Jesus. And Lord, we just pray, Lord, that this church will be here for your glory, for your praise, and for your honor. We just ask the Holy Spirit to have control, of, complete control of this service. In Jesus' name, amen. The title of the message this morning is God's Little Girl. God's Little Girl. Uh, real faith, you know, uh, this little girl had real faith, and real faith is contagious. Uh, it is, it, it is uh, real faith is, uh, she had real faith, she had real forgiveness, and uh, real faith is contagious. You know, it, it is something that others want when they see real faith. You know, there's, you go through the world, and you don't see a whole lot of faith out there, but when someone sees a real child of God who has real faith, it is contagious, and it's something that others want to get a hold of. Uh, and we need to be the kind of Christian this morning who has real faith in our life, working, a working faith, a real faith in our life. But before we begin, I want to give a little background history and text for our, our text this morning. You know, David said to the prophet Nathan, he said, uh, you know, see now I dwell in a house of cedars, but the ark of God dwelleth with curtains. And Nathan said to the king, go do all that is in thine heart for the Lord is with thee. But when Nathan went home, after he had told David, listen, yeah, you want to build a house to God? That's a wonderful thing. Nathan said, the prophet Nathan said, go ahead, go do all that's in your heart. It's okay. And Nathan went home that night, and he, he probably went to bed just like normal. He probably said his prayers just like normal. But he had a vision in the night, and God came to him in the night and said, listen, you don't need to allow David to build this temple. David is a man of war, and I want the man who builds my temple to be a man of peace. I don't want a man of war building my temple uh, to the holy God. But he said, listen, I want you to go to David. I want you to tell him, uh, David, I took you from the sheep coat. I took you from tendering sheep, and I made you the king of the, my people. I made you head of all my people. And now, you know, I, I, I didn't, did I ever ask? Did I ever ask for a house of cedar to dwell in? You know, when I went with you from day to day in the wilderness, from place to place, went from here to there, did I ever ask that you would give me a house of cedar to dwell in? Uh, God is so big. Listen, the earth is his footstool. How can you make a temple to God? And he tells these things to Nathan in a dream and a vision by night. And Nathan goes back to David and he says, listen, um, I understand you want to build a temple to me, but God has told me in a vision is not for you to do. He said, uh, God said, you know what? He's going to pla place his people in a land and he's going to plant them there. And the, in the land of Israel, by the way, is God's place for his people. And, and he says, I'm going to plant my people, Israel, in a place. And when I do that, I'm going to allow your son, after your death, to build the temple. And when we read here in this morning in our text, what we're seeing here is the vision uh, fulfilled. Uh, this prophecy being fulfilled. Long story short, Solomon becomes king and fulfills the prophecy by building the temple that he was prophesied to build. It took seven long years to build the temple. 
Think about, think about that. That's a long time. Seven long years to build the temple. After the temple is completed and finished construction, they have a dedication service and sacrifice to the Lord God. And as they're doing that, the glory of the Lord fills the temple. The word of the God says this in uh, 1 Kings 8.10. And it came to pass when the priests were come out of the holy place that the cloud filled the house of the Lord so that the priest could not stand to minister because of the cloud. For the glory of the Lord had filled the house of the Lord. Can you imagine this morning? Wouldn't that be an amazing thing to see? The glory of God filling, filling a building so that the ministers and the, the priests could not even stay in the house. You know, here's guys who were dedicated to work for the Lord. Here's guys who were sanctified, priests who were sanctified to work in the house of God. And the glory of the Lord came in so strong in that temple that they had to move out. Amen? Wouldn't that be an amazing thing to see? That would be an amazing thing to see. Solomon gives a speech to Israel after this happens. And then Solomon prays. And the text this morning is part of the prophetic prayer of Solomon over the temple that has been built. Seven long years in the building. And he says this, 1 Kings 8, 41, Moreover, concerning a stranger that is not of thy people Israel, but cometh out of a far country for thy name's sake. For they shall hear of thy great name, and of thy strong hand, and of thy stretched out arm. When he shall come and pray toward this house, hear thou in heaven thy dwelling place, and do according to all that the stranger calleth to thee for, that all the people of the earth may know that thy name, that all the people of the earth may know thy name, to fear thee, as do thy people Israel, and that they may know that this house which I have builded is called by thy name." I want to call your attention back to verse 41. You know, if you look at verse 41, it says, Moreover concerning a stranger that is not of thy people Israel, but cometh out of a far country for thy name's sake, for they shall hear of thy great name. There's, you know, Sol Solomon in his prayer was prophesying that, listen, there's going to be a time come when the word of God reaches faraway places and they hear about the wonders of how God brought the children of Israel from Egypt and he, he made them a peculiar people, and he separated them from the world, and he made them a peculiar people, and he did signs and wonders with his people. And he says there's going to come a time when the glory of God goes around the earth and strangers hear about this. And if they pray toward your temple, answer their prayer, and God will. And the Bible says here that they will. For they shall hear of thy great name, of thy strong hand, and of thy stretched out arm, when he shall come and pray toward this house. Hear thou in heaven thy dwelling place, and do according to all that the stranger calleth to thee for. In other words, when a stranger hears of how great God is, God is going to answer their prayer. Isn't that awesome? Isn't that amazing? Are you happy in church this morning? Amen. I like smiling faces. I like happy faces, people who are happy in church. I want these young people to know, listen, it's good to be in the house of the Lord. And we want people to be so happy to be here that, you know, they're paying attention to the sermon. They're saying amen, and, and they're praising the Lord for all that he does. Think about that. Oh, when a stranger in a faraway place hears about the glory of God, he can pray to God, and God will hear and answer his prayer. That is good news. Amen? amen. That's something to be excited about. Solomon dies around 931 B.C. Israel becomes divided. Uh, and becomes weaker. The Bible says, if a house be divided against itself... That house cannot stand. You know, it's important that God's people be together. It's important that God's people not be divided. Because the Bible says a house divided against itself cannot stand. And, and, and as, as Israel started to drift further and further away from God, and Solomon was a part of that, after Solomon's death, they were divided into two kingdoms. And as they became divided into two kingdoms, Israel became weaker and weaker. You had Judah and you had Israel, and they were fighting, constantly fighting with one another. Not a good thing for God's people to be fighting against each other. Amen? God's people should be in unity. God's people should be of one accord. God's people should be holding the book of God as the absolute and agree that that's the word of God and follow it. Amen? Amen. But Israel was divided. And Israel was going the wrong direction. And because of that, it gave occasion to the enemies of Israel to come in and to cause trouble with Israel. Not only were they fighting with one another after Solomon's death, they were fighting with the little, the little countries around them. And they came to a place because they would not listen to the prophets of God. Because God sent, God sent prophets to Israel. He sent prophets to Judah who prophesied repent and get right with God. 
and God will restore you before it's too late. But they wouldn't listen to the prophets. And as they wouldn't listen to the prophets, things got worse and worse and worse. And they were constantly at odds with one another and with other countries attacking them. One of these countries was Syria. And the Syrians who were uh, to the north of Israel, a little northeast of Israel, would come down in raiding parties, and they would raid Israel, and they would plunder, and they would pillage, and they would take captives. And in one of these times, uh, Syria sent down a little raiding party, and they went down, and they captured this little girl, and they carried away to Syria. Think about that. That's just a horrible thing. When a country gets away from God, bad things happen. And you may think, well, I'm a good person, and I'm following God, and I'm, I, I'm in Christ Jesus, so nothing bad will happen to me. That's not what the Bible says. The Bible says, all that live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. This little girl was probably living for God. I have no doubt that this little girl was living for God. She was God's girl. Young ladies, this is, and young men, we could all take a, take a page out of this young girl's life and say, wow, I would like to be like this young girl. Here she was living with her parents who probably loved her. I'm sure they loved her, cared for her. They taught her, the, they taught her the, 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 out, of the, out of the word of God. They wanted her to be uh, God's girl, and she was God's girl. And all of a sudden, a, Syrian, a little Syrian army comes down. They sweep into the town. They plunder. They pillage. And they take this little girl as captive, and they take her away from her home. Can you imagine what's going through her mind? I can't imagine. You know, we don't know how frightened she was. We don't know how angry maybe she was. We don't know how hard it was for her to be separated from her family and her friends, from her dad and mom who loved her, maybe from her brothers and sisters who loved her, taken away to a faraway place. She left, she left being a beloved daughter, and now she's an unloved servant. Think about that for a moment. All the things that would fill through her mind, and the, the, the devil attacking when, when, when you are separated from the things you want and things are not going the way you want, how easy it is to lose faith, isn't it? And say, why would God allow all this to happen to me? She could have done that. She could have gone to that place and said, why would God allow this to happen to me? God doesn't love me. It wasn't true. God did love her. Amen? Amen. But you see people in life, and all through life, when things are going good, it's so easy to say, oh, praise the Lord. God is so good. And lift your hands and praise God. But do we praise him when things are not going good? We need to, church, don't we? You know, when rough times are ahead, we need, to, we, need to, we need to have our faith being built in the good times so when the rough times come, we're ready for those things that happen. This little girl was a young girl. We don't know a lot about this little girl, but we know one thing. She was full of faith. Amen? Amen. She's a little girl that we could all emulate in her faithfulness. And this story so often is told about someone else in the story, but really the hero of this story, the heroine of the story is this little girl. And I think it's so important for young ladies young girls to see a godly example in scripture someone they can look up to and say wow i want to be like that and for all of us to look up to that and say wow i'd like to be like that anyone can say they have faith when they're going when things are going well but faith is tried in the fire it is not tried in the comfort zone anyone can say they have faith when everything is going according to plan though the holy bible says this in first peter 1 7 that the trial of your faith being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. This little girl was like a Job. I mean, think about it. She was like a Job. She understood you can't claim faith when everything goes perfectly and then abandon it when things that you perceive are going wrong. Listen to this. A life jacket... A life jacket. We all know what a life preserver is. You know, we've all been on boats or we've all seen pictures of these life preservers. A life jacket is not made for good times. Now, you may take one. You may take one. You may jump into a swimming pool and have all kinds of fun with that life jacket, floating you around and keeping you, you know, and, and just having fun. But a life jacket is not designed for uh, use in a swimming pool. It is designed for disaster. You think about that. Isn't that the way faith is? Amen? Amen? I mean, we can have faith. We can, we can have faith when everything's going well. That's, that's awesome to have faith when everything's going well. It's awesome to have a life jacket and jump in the pool and just splash around and have fun. But the life jacket is designed for disaster. And when disaster comes, young people, what do you do with the life jacket? You don't throw it over and say, well, that faith wasn't any good for me. You cling tighter to the faith. Amen? Amen. Because faith is designed for disaster. It's great when things are going good. You hold on to it when things are going good. But when things are going bad, you hold on to it even tighter. Amen? Amen? 
That's the way faith should be. This little girl understood, man, things aren't going my way. I'm not going to throw faith out the door. I'm not going to throw my life jacket out the door. I'm going to cling tighter to it. 2 Kings chapter 5 is where we're in, talking about the little girl. And she was like a Job. Job said this. Job said, what? Shall we receive good at the hand of God, and shall we not receive evil? In other words, you know what? When everything was going the way I wanted, Job was saying, when everything was going the way I wanted, I understood it was from God, and I praise God for the good in my life. And now that everything is going bad, and even, even his wife was against him, saying, why don't you curse God and die? He says, what? Shall we not receive good at the hand of God and not evil? When things are going good, isn't, when we praise God, when things are going God, should we not still praise the one who gave us the good things and the things that are still good in our life? Should we still not praise him? Should we not cling to faith a little tighter when things are hard? You know, the men may have taken this little girl for evil, but God can take what men want for evil and turn it into good. Amen? Amen? Amen. You think about that. There are people in your life who want to do wrong to you, and you have to understand God is in control over all of it. And someone can do something wrong to you, and you're angry about it, you're bitter about it, you're, 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 you're upset about it. But if you turn it over to God and say, God, it's yours, God can turn that evil into good. Yes. It's amazing what God can do. If we'll just give it to him and say, you know, I had faith in the good times. I understood in the good times that you were there and you were helping me and things were prospering and things were so awesome. But now in the bad times, I have to have even more faith and cling to that faith and say, God, even the bad you can turn into good. Amen? Amen? We have to have that kind of faith. And the only way you can have that kind of faith is to be in the word of God, young people. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. That's what I preached the whole sermon about last week. we got to be in the Bible. Without being in the Bible, we ha we have, our faith will be weak. These men who, who, who took her, maybe they did it for evil. Maybe they did it for money. We don't know their motive. But we know this young girl had faith. More than a grain of mustard seed. And we know that she understood what God's word was trying to convey to her. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God. To them who are the called according to his purpose. Here's God's girl in God's place. And the devil comes in and plucks her seemingly away. Nothing can pluck you away from God. Amen. He may, he may, it may appear that he plucks you away. And they, she was plucked out of her own house, taken over to Syria, and dumped there to be a servant. Kind of reminds you a little bit of Joseph, doesn't it? We don't see anywhere in the Bible where this girl becomes bitter. We don't see anywhere in the Bible where this girl becomes angry. We don't see anywhere in the Bible where this girl blames everything on God. All we see is a little girl who had faith. And who would cling to her faith and would forgive her enemies and love her enemies. Where does that come from? Well, if you were in Sunday school class, you'd know it comes from God. Amen? Amen? We don't know the process. We don't know if she was taken to one house and to another house and to another house and eventually where, how she ended up where she ended up. But she ended up in the house of one of the most prominent women of the whole kingdom as a little servant girl, a little maid to Naaman's wife. And I don't know, the Bible doesn't tell us what she was doing, but I can just picture this girl doing everything for the glory of God. Go take out the trash. Okay. Go, go do that. Okay. My pleasure. Right? My pleasure. Singing. Can you imagine this little girl going around the house doing the things that nobody else wants to do because she's the servant girl and she's singing to the Lord, I will bless the Lord at all times. I will bless the Lord at all times. At all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. I sought the Lord and he heard me and delivered me from all my fears. Can you imagine this little girl just singing through the house, just whistling and, and, and just having the joy of the Lord as she goes from menial task to menial task to menial task? Because so often we do that. You know, I just, as I read the story, I want to be more like this little girl. Somebody gives me something I don't want to do, and I get angry about it, I should just look to the Lord and say, I should do this to the Lord. Because listen, when someone you don't like gives you a task, your first option is, I'm going to be angry about this. I'm going to kick this. I'm going to be angry about this. I'm going to go do it, but I'm going to do it with a begrudging attitude. I'm going to be, I don't want to do this. Right? But think about this. Someone you don't like gives you a task, and you say, well, I'm going to do it for the Lord. How would I do it for the Lord? 
cheerfully, completely, the way it should be done the first time. Measure twice, cut once. Don't just zip it off right there. You know, you woodworkers, you woodworkers, you don't just zip it off right away and then go measure it. Oh, I got that wrong. You got to do that over and over and over again. Do it like Brother Stewart does it, man. He measures twice, he measures three times, he measures four times, and he cuts it right. And when he does it, it's right because why? Because he's learned this lesson. Let's do whatever we do to the glory of God. Amen? Amen. Young people, you go to school. Maybe you don't want to go to school. Maybe there's a class you don't want to take. Maybe there's something you don't like at school. Do it for the glory of God. Then you can do it happily. You can say, you know, I didn't want to do this, but God wants me to do it. I'm going to do it for the glory of God. This little girl, can you imagine just singing and being pleasant? And, you know, people were, you know, people were telling her, do this, do that, do this, do that. She's away from her family. She had every right to be bitter. She had every right to be angry. But she, we don't see that anywhere in Scripture. We see she forgave her enemies to the point that when her, when her mistress, her lady of the house, was sad, Maybe she was crying. Maybe she heard it from somewhere else. We don't know. All we know is maybe she was, maybe she was distraught because here it is, Naaman's wife. And maybe she's crying and maybe she's upset and she hears, she overhears Naaman's wife lamenting that her husband has leprosy. Leprosy was a death sentence. Leprosy was a horrible disease. Leprosy meant you had to be separated from your family. Leprosy meant they couldn't have the contact that they once had. And, and, the, and the wife was so upset about this, and maybe she was crying. And the little girl comes up and says, oh, oh, I wish you knew who I knew. I wish you knew who I know. I wish you knew about the prophet that I know about. And the little girl says this, would, would God, my Lord, were with the prophet that is in Samaria, for he would recover him as was leprosy. Can you imagine that? And Naaman's wife's probably like, what? Yeah, would to God that you knew the prophet that I know. And I, I you know the Bible didn't tell us, but I'm sure Naaman's wife's probably like, her ears probably perked up. And she's like, well, tell me about it. What's a prophet? And I can just hear the little girl say, listen, a, a prophet is a man of God. You know, I, I'm from Israel, and we serve the one and the only God. There is no other there's only one God, and our God is all-powerful. Our God is the one who created heaven and earth. He created everything. He created all things, and there's nothing outside of his plan. There's nothing outside of his power. There's nothing outside of his scope. And we have a prophet. His name's Elisha. You should hear about the things he's done. And I'm sure his wife's probably like, well, tell me, what has he done? And the little girl, she probably says, you know what? I want to tell you what he did. One time, there were some men... There was a hungry man, a hundred hungry men. Can you imagine a hundred hungry men? I mean, these guys were workers. These guys could eat a lot. I mean, some of these teenagers can eat a lot. They can eat a whole pizza. They can eat two pizzas. They can eat three pizzas. They'll, they'll, they'll say, I can eat more pizza than you can eat. And they can do it. There was a hundred hungry guys. And she's telling that she's saying, you know what? There was a hundred hungry guys. And, and, and there was a man uh, from Belshazzar. Uh, I can't pronounce the name. And, and he had 20 loaves of barley and full ears of corn. And the man of God said to Gehazi, his servant, he said, well, let's just set these out and we'll pray over them and God will bless it. And Gehazi said, should we set out 20 loaves of barley and full husk of corn? That's going to feed 100 men? And Elisha, the prophet of God, said, don't worry, it'll feed them. There'll be some left over. Amen? Amen. And guess what? Guess what? They laid out the 20 loaves of barley and the full ears of corn, and those men ate and ate and ate until they couldn't eat anymore, and they took up the fragments that were left over. That's what the, God, that's what the man of God can do, because he knows God. Amen. That's not all. Amen? Amen. There's a poor widow woman. There's a poor widow woman. And Elisha came to her, and she said, Elisha, I've got two sons. I'm a widow. I've got no way to, I've got no way to do anything. I've, I'm in debt. The creditors are coming. They're going to come. They're going to take away my house. They're going to take my two sons, and they're going to make them servants for the rest of their life. And Elisha says, what do you have in the house? And she said, oh, i got the bottle of oil. And he said, well, go send your two sons out. Have them collect every empty vessel in the, in the, in that you can find. And they go out, and they collect all these empty vessels, empty vessels, empty bottles, empty pitchers, and they bring them to the man of God. And the man of God says, just start pouring the oil into them. And she takes that one vessel of oil and starts pouring it, fills one up, fills another one up, fills another one up, fills another one up, and does that until all the empty vessels are completely full. She had enough to pay the debt. 
little girl said, that's not all. Amen? Amen. That's not all. There was a woman who, who heard about the man of God, and she said, let's just build him a little place to sleep when he comes by. We'll just build him a little place because he's so busy, and he travels from here, and he travels to there, and he's always doing God's work, and he never asks for anything. Let's just build him a little place of shelter when he comes that he can stay there. And, and, they, and they build him that place, and he came by, and he stayed there. And at one time he thought, well, what does this woman want? And he asked his servant, he said, Gehazi, what does she want? What can I do for this woman who has had compassion upon the servant of God? And Gehazi says, well, her husband is really old. They can't have children, and she would love to have a baby. And Elisha says, you know what? Next year at this time, you'll have a son. Amen? Amen. And the baron was able to have a son. And it doesn't stop there. One day while the son and the father were out working, the son got hot. And he said, oh, my head, my head, my head, I'm, I, I don't feel good. And he went in and he died. And the woman called for the man of God. And the man of God saw her coming. And he said, is that well with you? And she said, it's well. But it wasn't well. Her, 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 son, was, her son had died. And she said, why would you give me a son and take him away? She basically said, fix it. <laughs> fix it. And the man of God sent Gehazi the servant with his staff. He didn't even go right away himself. He sent a staff, and he put a staff on the boy. And when Elisha, the man of God, finally showed up, he stretched himself on the boys and his eyes to his eyes and his hands to his hand, and he prayed over the boy. The boy sneezed seven times and alive from the dead. Amen? Amen. The prophet fed the hungry, he saved the poor, and he raised the dead. Oh, if only your husband could go and see this man who knows the God of all creation. I know he could heal your husband. Now, the Bible doesn't tell us that she, she told all those stories. All the Bible says is this. She says this. She says, would, would God, my Lord, were with the prophet that is in Samaria, for he would recover him of his leprosy. And her faith was contagious, wasn't it? You know what's amazing? Her faith was so con contagious, they had seen her live out her faith in such a way that they were willing to believe in someone they had not seen because of the faith that they had seen in her. Can you imagine being that kind of, that kind of person? Where you tell these stories that are so fantastic I mean, those stories are so fantastic, who would believe it? But they saw this little girl live such a life in front of them that when she told the most outrageous, fantastic story, they didn't even question it for one second. That is the way to live in front of people. That's the way to get more, that's the way to get more people saved, is to live such a life that when you say something, people don't question it. They say, how do we get to that person? How do we get to that person? How do we get to Elisha? Look at this, 2 Kings 5, 3 through 5. And she said unto her mistress, Would God my Lord were with the prophet that is in Samaria, for he would recover him of his leprosy. You see, this little girl has no doubt. She has total faith. She says, listen, if he could get to the guy in Samaria, the prophet of God, he would be healed. The little girl had no doubt. That's faith that will move a mountain, Right? The Bible talks about faith that will move a mountain. A grain of mustard seed of faith can move a whole mountain. Look at what this girl moved with her faith. She said, Would God my Lord were with the prophet that is in Samaria, for he would recover him of his leprosy. And the next verse, number four. And one went in and told his Lord, saying, Thus and thus said the maid that is of the land of Israel. And the king of Syria said, Go to go, I will send a letter unto the king of Israel. And he departed and took with him ten talents of silver and six thousand pieces of gold and ten changes of raiment. Wow. Yeah. But this little girl said, if he was in Samaria, he'd be healed. They don't question it. They say, go. Take this with you. Go. They don't question her one second. This is a little girl. God's a little girl, though. I mean, you be God's little girl and you live God's life, and you, do, you put God first, and when you pray, things move. Amen? You can move a mountain if you're living like God's girl. Young men, if you're living like God's man, you pray and things can happen. I would have such faith. I can't imagine having that kind of faith. I mean, we all want to have that kind of faith. 
So when you have a friend or a coworker or someone you know who has a need and they have a need that's beyond your help and you can say to them, oh, that you would meet my Jesus. Amen? Let me tell you about him. Let me tell you about my Jesus. You have a need, let me tell you about my Jesus. One time there was 5,000 and they were hungry. 5,000 people and all there were were five loaves and two fishes and there were 5,000 people and they were hungry. And they went to Jesus and they said, what do we do? And he says, well, let's just pray over this five loaves, and, five loaves and two fishes. And he prays over the five loaves and two fishes and they start passing them out. And they pass them out and people eat and eat and eat and eat and eat. And they take up baskets full. Amen? Amen. And there was a man named Lazarus. He was dead four days. He was dead so long that he stank. And Jesus comes walking in like nothing's wrong. And the, the sisters, Mary and Martha, come. They say, well, if you would have been here, my, 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 my brother would not have died. And Jesus simply walked over and said, Lazarus, come forth. Amen. And the dead rose to life. Amen. And there was a man who had a debt that he could not pay. No matter how hard he would work, he couldn't pay it. No matter what he would do, he could not pay it. And no matter what he would strive for, he could not pay it. It was a debt that was impossible to pay. But Jesus came and paid the debt, didn't he? Amen? Wouldn't it be amazing if you could tell these stories to people and they'd be like, wow, if he said it or if she said it, I just want to get to that person. I just want to experience what that person's experienced, to have that kind of faith. Because Jesus is more than a prophet. Jesus is God in the flesh come down to save mankind. He fed the hungry, he saved the poor, and he raised the dead. If only you could see him. Amen? Amen. We need to have such faith that is contagious that people would believe every word we say. You know, you think about what this girl did. This is the voice of a little girl. And her voice moved the greatest, the greatest military captain in Syria to move somewhere, to go and take a journey. And the voice of this little girl caused a king to write a letter and the voice of this little girl caused a king who was backslidden to go seek out a prophet. Think about that for a moment. Listen, you may think this morning that you're insignificant. We don't know this little girl's name. We don't even know her name. You may think this morning, I am so insignificant, no one even knows my name. But if you have faith in God... And walk in integrity, God knows your name. Amen. And if God knows your name, it doesn't matter who does not know your name. When you pray, you come before the presence of God. And when you pray, God hears your voice. And when God hears your voice and starts to answer your prayer, things begin to move. Amen? Amen? So you're not insignificant to God. And when you're not insignificant to God, you're so important that God sent his son from heaven to come down to earth to die for your sins so that you can be saved, so that you can be his girl or his boy or his man or his woman. And nothing is impossible. I mean, think about this for a moment. She quite possibly saved her nation. I mean, Syria was, at this point, Syria was probably more powerful than Israel. When Syria, when the king of Syria wrote a letter to the king of Israel, and they delivered that letter with Naaman, the king of Israel rent his clothes, and he said, what am I, God, that I can heal a man that's going to die? He was scared of Syria. It's quite possible this girl saved her nation. She was the vessel that brought salvation to Naaman. Think about that for a moment. She was the one that told Naaman he had to go and see the prophet of God. And after he saw the prophet of God, and after God touched his life, and maybe I'll preach on that sometime, the baptism of Naaman, he became a believer. He said, there's no God in all the earth but the God of Israel. She quite possibly saved a nation. She, brought, she was the vessel that brought the good news of not only physical healing, but spiritual healing to Naaman. We don't know all of the story, but I can just imagine she may have been delivered safely home. Can you imagine this little girl who's taken away from her family and praying, God, get me back safe. 
Her family's at home praying, God, bring her back safe. How could that happen? What if she would have went over there and just been just a horrible servant? Go take out the trash. You take it out. Got whipped, beat, whatever, and then got even meaner. Doesn't that happen to a lot of us? But because she was willing, when things were good, to have faith in God, and understanding that faith, faith is made for trouble, she clung to her faith, she got closer to God, and she said some prayers that were answered many, many, many years later. And I think probably her parents were praying for her, her country was, some of her country people were praying for her, and she was praying, God, deliver me back home to my family. And I think through all of this, the Bible doesn't tell us the end of the story, but I can just imagine when Naaman gets home, he tells this little girl, what do you want I've been healed of my leprosy. I've been cleansed from my leprosy. I'm no longer a leper. I can live the rest of my life out in physical health. But not only that, I've met the God that you've talked about. I've seen the prophet that you've talked about. And everything that you said was true. And I'm saved. What do you want? What can I give you? And all the little girl had to do is say, I want to go home. Can you imagine? A faith that moves mountains is a faith that does the mundane and a faith that overcomes the trouble and a faith that clings even in destructive times it clings to that which gives life a life jacket is not designed for specifically for joy it is designed for disaster and this girl understood that her faith was designed for disaster. When disaster came, she had a life jacket that she could hold on to, and she had a lifeline that she could hold on to that would bring her safely through whatever disaster was in her life. Do you have that this morning? That's the question. Because if not, I want to tell you, there's, there's someone who's more than a prophet. There's someone who's greater than Elisha, and his name is Jesus. And if you'll come to him, he can cleanse you not only of your physical ailments, but he can cleanse you of your spiritual ailments and he can set you free. Let's pray this morning. Our Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you, Lord, for all that you do. We thank you, Lord, that you had a little girl who was willing and obedient, who loved you more than she loved herself, who loved her enemies enough to pray for them, who loved her enemies enough to tell them about your power and about your glory. Pray, Lord, this morning that uh, the name of Jesus has been magnified here this morning. We pray, Lord, that if there's anyone out here in the audience who has not been saved, that they'll give their life to you, that you can save their soul from hell, and that you can cleanse them from all of their sin. Uh, Lord, there's people who have leprosy of the soul, and they need to be saved. Just pray, Lord, that they'll uh, just come to you, that you can save them. And just pray, Lord, that you'll bless the invitation. Pray, Lord, for the Holy Spirit to do a work. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Ask for a song of